So 5-4, we're going to talk about more of the integration formulas. You will see that we've already done some of this stuff. Uh, the net change theorem is going to be a little more uh, useful, more dif different than we've seen before. So um, you have these formulas. I think they're all written down. Is that correct? They're on, on your sheet. Uh, if they're not, let's, let's just talk about them. So these are formulas we have seen before. Okay. But this just says that if we have a, uh, if we're taking an integral and there's a constant in front, you can bring the constant out, uh, outside the integral and multiply it by the answer. So we can just multiply it by that antiderivative. Remember, if you have a constant inside, so here they've called that constant k, if you go backwards, you would have a kx plus c. The antiderivative or the integral of the sine is negative cosine. Secant squared becomes a tangent. Secant tangent, that integral becomes a secant. You can add two things and do them individually. Here's the opposite of our power rule. We're going to add one to the power and divide by that new power. The integral of the cosine is the sine. The integral of the cosecant is the negative cotangent. The integral of the cosecant cotangent is the negative cosecant. So all the ones that started out with a co uh, whether it's cosine, cotangent, cosecant, when you do the antiderivative, you have to change those signs. Okay? So those are formulas we are already familiar with. It's just a matter of uh, just kind of revisiting those. Now, we have done, you'll see that the title of that table is an indefinite integral. So a, in 5-3, um, we did more definite integrals where they had a boundary. So when we do an indefinite integral, we are just getting the antiderivative. And then when we do that, bless you, when we do that antiderivative, uh, that's why we include the plus C because we're getting kind of the general uh, form of the uh, antiderivative is our integral. Because remember, the derivative of an integral is the function that you started with, so the antiderivative would be the integral. Okay. So those are just things we kind of already know, but they're all in one nice little place for you to look at. So let's undo a power rule. Let's just practice. And, and then they throw in uh, boundaries. So it's a uh, definite integral, but I, I don't know. Really. Anyway, um, <laughs> so um, just like when we're doing any sort of uh, in a, or derivatives, I always told you to get it as nice as you can. Uh, do any rewrites first. So I would rewrite this here as a t to the one half and then I would distribute it in. So we would end up with a t to the one half plus a t to the three halves dt. Now we're just going to do the antiderivative first and then we'll put uh, the boundaries in. So uh, our one half power goes up by one so it becomes a three halves but when we divide by three halves just flip that over and multiply by its reciprocal. Same thing with our next one. That's going to go up to 5 halves, but we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. And then I'm going to put my little borders there on that little line, uh, that notation, to tell me that I have to do upper bounds minus lower bounds. The upper bound um, is 4. Now let's discuss what, how you take 4 to the 3 halves. Uh, the bottom of the fraction acts like a square root. So I would probably do the square root of 4 first. 
get two, and then use the top. So I usually use the bottom if possible, and then use the top. It seems to go algebraically. You can do it in your head much quicker that way. So that's really an eight. So we are going to have two third times eight. Now to the five halves, uh, we would get two to the fifth. So that's going to be 32. Now, one thing I noticed when, when you were doing some of these, when you went to do the, um, uh, the lower bound, um, any mistakes that were being made, I think could be fixed if you just use a parenthesis there. And remember that you are subtracting whatever you get. So if the thing is negative that you're getting, please, you have to account for the fact when you subtract a negative, it becomes a plus. But anyway, when we stick a 1 in, 1 to any power is still 1. So this is just going to be 2 thirds plus 2 thirds. So what I like to do, what I found uh, to be good, is I just left this thirds. I didn't try to do anything to it. Um, that is 16 thirds, and that is 64 fifths minus 2 thirds and minus two-fifths. Because we have some common denominators, I tended so that uh, I didn't have to jump right to a calculator to um, uh, blend them together first. So this is 14 thirds plus 62 fifths. And then you can see our only denominators are three and five. The least common multiple of that is 15. So we're going to get those to be fifteenths. If I multiply 14 times 5, you get 70. If you multiply 62 times 3, you get 186. And then we can just add those together. 70 plus 186 is 256. Oop. Now, 256 um, is a multiple of 2. It's like 2 to the maybe 8th power. There are no 2's contained in the number 15. So there is no way for us to go further, so just leave it. I, I, you know, mixed numbers aren't super helpful unless maybe we were going to have to graph something and we want to know like that precise location and, and we could see the mixed number. Otherwise, eh, it is what it is. Now, um, uh, the net change theorem kind of will add in an element more of um, the possibility of using an integral for an application. And so it says that if we have some function that is representing a rate, so this is a rate. What do we know a derivative is? It's a rate of change. So if we take the integral of the rate, which is already a derivative, you're kind of anti-derivative, you know how that works. And so you get the, the change in that particular thing uh, from A to B. Now, now let's put it in some context, okay? So if I know, and, and I'm just making this up here, I know the change in the volume. Remember when we were doing related rates? Uh, from one second to four seconds. And I want to know what is the net change in my volume after I'm done. Well, you can just take the antiderivative of four minus the antiderivative of one, and you will find out how much the volume has changed over that time span. So... Unit yeah, easier. so so it just uh, ends up, there are lots of applications of this. If I know the rate, then I can undo it and then find the net change over that time span. So, so that's kind of interesting. Now, I will tell you, when, when I do the volume... I'm sorry, volume, uh, when I do one of the ones that feel more like a related rate, um, those ones I tend to use integral notation. Because we're so used to going from a velocity problem backwards to a position function problem, I don't always use integ integral notation that way. So I'll show you both ways when we do ones that are like a velocity and position kind of 
examples, like example 524. So it says, given the velocity function, we want to know uh, from time 0 to time 3, what is the net displacement of the particle? So where, how much did it move from the beginning to the end? Where did it end up? Okay. So we can just do the uh, integral from 0 to 3 of the velocity function. Now, we know that the antiderivative is the position. So it makes sense that if we take the integral, which is the antiderivative of our position, or I'm sorry, of our velocity, that we're getting some information about the position. So that would be the position at time 0 minus, minus from the position at time 3. So you would get your net uh, displacement. Um, but let's go ahead and just do the antiderivative, and then I'll show you um, another, another way. Okay, so if you uh, do the antiderivative, we get 3t squared divided by 2 minus 5t. We're going to evaluate it from 0 to 3. We get 27 halves minus 15 minus 0 minus 0. So that's 27 halves minus 30 halves or negative 3 halves. Now, look at our units. Our units were meters per second. So um, this would be meters. The negative would mean if you were going from left to right, the negative might mean that you have ended up uh, left from where you started. If you're up and down, that, that would be you are down further than where you started. That would be a net displacement. So just like before, we realized that the integral is a net uh, change. Uh, if we want the, the total displacement, we do have to look at where is the thing positive and negative, and, and, and we would have to take the absolute value. So watch the wording. So in the next one, it's like I've read their minds. In the next one, they say, well, what is the total difference distance traveled? Because think about it. If all I know is you started at my classroom door, and you ended up at the stairs. So the total distance is from here to the stairs. That's your net displacement. But maybe you uh, went and you um, went from my room over to the media center and then back and then you went down to this hall and all I knew was you ended up over at the stairs. Do I really know how much you actually walked around? I don't. So that's the difference here is for a total distance traveled, it is technically, from A to B, it is the absolute value of the velocity. Now, how do absolute values work? It's going to make that negative part positive, so it will account for that particular distance. Okay. Now, think about a linear equation. A linear equation has a definite spot where it changes from negative to positive. That's the x-intercept. So if we look at where this equals 0 to start, we'll be able to determine where it switched from positive to negative. And so you just take and you solve for t, and you get 5 thirds. So if we were to graph this, OK, we have a y-intercept of negative 5, an x-intercept of 5 thirds. Our graph looks something like that. So remember how we do integration. This is negative. This is positive. So we are not... Uh, calculating the total, you're just doing the net. We have to subtract that bottom off. So to fix that problem, the way that I think about it is that I need to go from 0 to 5 thirds, and I need to flip that. Let's put it out front. That's a little easier. And I need to flip that to become the negative that it was. It needs to flip to become a positive. So a negative times a negative, I need to 
change the sign. And so that section, I am going to take the opposite of the original integral. So that will take that negative value and make it a positive value. But from 5 thirds up to 3, it's perfectly fine because it is a positive value. So we don't have to change that section. Okay? That's the difference. 5 thirds is the key. By finding where it hits the, uh, you know, so some knowledge of the graph it is very helpful. So in this first piece, when we do the antiderivative, we're going to get the opposite of, bless you, 3t squared over 2 minus 5t from 0 to 5 thirds. And then in this section, we're just going to get positive 3t squared minus 5t from 5 thirds to 3. That's the difference. We do have to split it apart. What we're accounting for is if we travel backwards and then forward again. And in this case, we have a negative section and a positive section. So this, you can think of, that's negative 3t squared over 2 plus 5t. That's what I'm plugging in 0 to 5 thirds. And this one stayed the way it was. So when I plug in... Um, Let's plug in this section here. So I get negative 3 halves. 5 thirds squared is 25 ninths. So I'm just going to write it like that just so, you know. And then 5 times 5 thirds is 25 thirds. And then minus 0. I'm just going to put that little marker there because it's not always going to be 0. So it's just going to fix your issues if you assume it's going to be 0. If you have something there, that means you at least thought about it and checked it. Okay. And then here we're going to add uh, 5 thirds again. And so if we add 5 thirds again, um, we have 3 halves. No, no, no. Oh, I have to plug in 3 first. I'm sorry. That's not the way it should work. <laughs> Let's plug in 3. We get 27 halves minus 15 minus when we plug in 5 thirds. Now we already plugged in 5 thirds once, but um, you're going to get 3 halves times 25 over 9 minus uh, 5 times 5 halves. Uh, let's, let's make that 25 thirds. Okay. Now let's go ahead and, and mush everything. Let's put everything together. Let's make things a little prettier. Okay. So this one becomes negative 25 over um, 6. That one's 25 thirds. This one's 27 halves, 15. This one is negative 25, 6, and this one is plus 25. So all I did was kind of just make things a little nicer. Let's make sure I got everything I needed to. Perfect. Okay. If you get a common denominator of 6, I'm not going to bore you with that, um, you get 41 over 6. And that is the total distance travel. So uh, if, if you think about our, our first answer, our first answer of net displacement, meaning based on where we started, where do we end up? We ended up at negative 1.5 meters, uh, let's put a little meters, um, 1.5 meters back from the start, yes. Um, but this time, what that tells me is the total distance traveled is 41 sixths. So if uh, the total distance traveled, um, that means I might have went forward, then backward, then forward, then back. You know, so that's kind of what that accounts for. Now this particular function, this is going backwards and this is going forward. So then they equated that distance and that was this. And then they uh, um, uh, added that on to this. And that's why they get a number a little higher than before. Okay. So that is um, a velocity type one. Now, we, we know about position function and things like that. We, we, can, we can do what we did before and take the antiderivative, find the position function, you know, and it still works. 
So you can do it a mixture of ways now that you have that knowledge. Okay. But let's look at an actual application that feels more like what this is intended for. Okay. We know that a boat is consuming uh, 5 minus T cubed gallons per hour during the first hour of uh, your travel. And we want to know uh, how much gas is used in the first hour. So we know we have a formula for the rate in which we're using gallons. So this is the key here. That's gallons per hour. So when we integrate gallons per hour, the answer is going to be gallons. So remember, if you're integrating a rate, the net change is going to give you that top thing of your rate, gallons per hour, in this case gallons. They wanted us to calculate from the first hour, so we're going to assume from 0 to 1. And so we can just integrate that and plug our values in. Okay, so, you know, antiderivative would be 5t minus t to the fourth over 4, plug in in 0 and 1. Well, if you plug in 1, you get 5 minus 1 fourth, and then it's going to be minus 0. And so we get uh, 20 fourths minus 1 fourth is 19 fourths. Now, what does that mean? 19 fourths is equivalent to 4.75 gallons. And if you put 19 fourths gallons, that, that is correct too. Um, so the, the boat used 4.75 gallons during its first hour of travel. Does that make sense how that one works? Okay. One thing I want to mention is about integrating even and odd functions and how you can use the knowledge that a function is even or odd um, to um, make the math go quicker. If a function is even and we are integrating these boundaries have to be perfectly symmetric, negative a to positive a, then we can split it apart and just double the area from 0 to a. Now, let's, let's, let's do this first one. Let's call this one a. Let's do that one first. Okay. If we have a function... that is symmetric, would you agree that the area right here on the right side of the y-axis is exactly the same as the area over there? So if we are calculating the area from negative 1 to positive 1, the area from negative 1 to positive 1, we'll call this f, is the same as double the area from 0 to 1. Now, why is that even something that you would want to do? You don't have to, but sometimes if you have a complicated function that you're plugging into, 0 is easier to plug in than other numbers. So that's why you might want to do that. Is it essential that you do that? No, not at all. Is it helpful sometimes? Yeah, because then you can just plug in zero. We've seen many, many times when you plug in zero, you get zero. So that makes just that plug in, that, that, the algebra of it, uh, just a little nicer. So for even functions, if they have that, that symmetry and the area on one side of the y-axis equals the area of the other side, you're, you're welcome to do that process. Now, if you have the same boundaries on an odd function, the area is zero. Now let's think about why. And that one's a great one to know. Okay, so let's say we have a cubic function that looks like that. And let's say, uh, if, if I graphed it right, let's say that 
we are going from negative 2 to positive 2. We'll call that function g. That answer is 0 without doing any calculations. Why? Well, if it has that push pin in the middle, this is doing exactly what that is doing. It's either going to show up in 1 and 3 or 2 and 4. So like that or possibly like that. Think about the area. This area is exactly the negative version of this area. So if this area is a positive 2.5, I have no idea what it is. If this area, well, let's say it's, it's uh, 0.8, this area would be negative 0.8. And so that's why it ends up canceling each other out. So if you see an integration and you happen to notice it's an odd function. Now, what are odd functions? Odd functions are our cubic fifth power. Uh, if every power uh, is odd, that's a good indication it might be an odd function. If every power is even, it might be an even function. Be careful with constants that can mess that up. But that's just a little trick. You don't have to use that trick. That trick is um, uh, not necessary. Uh, look at something that's kind of interesting. Do they do it? No. Um, look at look at this. Look at our sine function and our cosine function. Uh, let's go from negative uh, pi over two to positive pi over two for both of them. For our sine function, um, uh, I just gotta remember. Our sine function from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 looks like that. So if I want to integrate from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, what's my answer? It's 0. But look at a cosine function. I just got to think about that. It's going to be it is an even function, yeah, it looks like this. So if we're integrating from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 of our cosine function, what we can do instead is we can just double the area we find right there, because the answer would be done. So we could do 2 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2, and we would get the same thing. Odd functions are nicer, I mean, obviously, because you get that zero occurring if these boundaries are exactly placed um, equidistant from zero. Um, this, it might be beneficial to have to plug in zero. You know, plugging in zero is always a lovely, wonderful thing. Okay. Okay. So it says here to integrate an even function. Um, so let's take a look at why this is even. Remember, an even function, if we plug in negative x, it's the same as what we started with. So if to check this evenness, if you plug in negative x into that function, you get exactly what you started with. So that's why it's even. So if you notice, our boundaries are also symmetric. We go from negative 2 to positive 2. So if we look at that function, and, and this graph is not going to be super accurate, but I'll do my best. Um, if we go from negative 2 to positive 2, let's assume we're counting by 2s. The graph uh, looks... Uh, uh, let's see, negative 2, positive 2, uh, 2 to the 8th is uh, like 256. I mean, that's just going to be huge. 
it's even going to be bigger than that, but it's going to look something like this. Okay, and uh, we we would have to count more by t more than twos, but um, so what is three times two to the eight? So, yeah, that's seven hundred sixty-six. So let's assume. Let's assume this is 766. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but based on the symmetry of this, to make our work a little nicer, since this area is a perfect match to that area, we can just double from 0 to 2. So when we go to plug in, it just makes it the work a little nicer. So we would get, what, 3x to the 9th over 9, minus 2x, and then we're going to double that, and then we're going to plug in 0 and 2. And if you went and did that, that's 528, um, you get 500 over 3. So, you know, uh, it, it just makes the algebra a little nicer because if you plug in zero, you do get zero. So, you know, it just, it just makes the work a little nicer. If that didn't occur to you when you looked at this and you just did this and you plugged in positive two minus the quantity at negative two, you'd be perfectly fine. You'd get the same exact answer. So that, but that's just a little nice little shortcut. Okay. Let's talk about an odd function. Sine is an odd function, so the sine of negative x is the opposite of, that's the check, that's what an odd function does. If you plug in negative x, you get the opposite of what you started with. Uh, also, the symmetry of a sine has a, a bump there and a bump there, so it, it's an odd function. All of our trig functions are odd except for the cosine and the secant, they're the only ones that are even. So uh, we can evaluate this by just doing 2 from 0 to pi because these uh, boundaries of integration are perfectly symmetrical to the uh, uh, x-axis or y-axis. And so you can just double what you get. And so, um, oh, no, we don't have to even do that, do we? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we don't have to do that. I was really overthinking that one. Um, because since it's odd, what the negative 5 does, if you were to look at the graph, uh, it changes the amplitude to 5 and flips it. So this one goes up by 5, and this one goes down by 5. But this is the exact, if we call this uh, area A, this is the negative of A. And so you'll see that this is just A minus A. So that one is a zero. Sorry, I was going to make that much more difficult than I had to. Uh, if you do the actual integration, you get uh, 5 cosine of x. So if you want to check it, you do get 5 cosine of x from negative pi to positive pi. Uh, that's 5 times the cosine of pi minus 5 times the cosine of negative pi. Both negative pi and positive pi get you in the same location, 180 degrees. That's negative 1. So this is 5 times negative 1 minus 5 times uh, negative 1, which gives you uh, negative 5 plus 5, or 0. So if it doesn't occur to you, the rules that we have done so far um, are exactly, they're okay. You can just do the rule. But if you happen to notice it's an even or odd function, uh, sometimes this just makes your work a little easier, especially if it's an odd function <laughs> when it occurs to you. It's, it's just an easier thing to do. So uh, here, uh, please look in Google Classroom. I think this is different. Here, let's, let's actually do a little check here. I think we're going to do it out of the other book, but just so. if it doesn't load, there we go.
Yeah, so you're going to use the uh, white book with the red kind of uh, little integral symbol. Um, we're going to do 4.4 uh, odds, 1 to 39, and 47. And then after we get that done, then we're going to do some word problems together um, after that. So that's it. Do your thing.